Hey there, I'm Pastor Darrell. Welcome to Mount Moriah. So uh, last week we uh, got to celebrate baptism for uh, a few folks in our church here at Mount Moriah. And uh, we divided that into two services. So if you watched our worship service last week and you missed the baptism service, what I would encourage you to do is go back on our Facebook or go back on YouTube and watch how awesome it is to see uh, a few kids and a few adults uh, giving their lives, not only have they given their lives to Christ, but have uh, stepped out in a pro- uh, public profession of faith. And, and that's incredible. It's something that we all should, should do as believers in Christ and following obedience to his command uh, and really just showing the world that we love Jesus. That's the incredible part about it. So this morning we're going to combine uh, two things that we do here at, at Mount Moriah. We're going to combine a baby dedication with our worship service this morning. And, and here's what the cool thing, I know you're saying, well, we did it backwards. <laughs> well, maybe. Uh, But not necessarily, because what it takes is faithful Christians to produce new Christians and and, and children who need to know the Lord. And and God has created them. God has given them to us. And then we have a responsibility, not only as parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters, uh, all of those. We have a responsibility that's been given to us in Scripture to dedicate those children as believers, to dedicate those children back to God. Now, what we're going to do here this morning uh, doesn't impart salvation upon these ch- this child, uh, and I want to be clear about that. This child, a- at this moment, we believe, bec- according to Scripture, it is held in God's hands because they're not old enough or they're not able. Uh, not, it has nothing really to do with age, but they're not able to make a profession of faith on their own. So it has nothing to do with the salvation of the child, but what it has everything to do with is the dedication and the devotion of the parents to bring up a child in a way God should have them brought up, bringing them up so that later on they have enough ammunition, so to speak, in this world filled with spiritual warfare, enough ammunition to make a really good decision, and that decision is to place their faith in Jesus Christ. Um, Some kids will come to know Christ without good Christian parents and and without good Christian grandparents and things like that through the grace of God. But but the ultimate design, as we'll find out this morning, is that God is going to use us and he's going to use those parents and, and those faithful believers to bring kids up in such a way that they will come to know Jesus. And so that's the important thing that we're doing here this morning. I'm going to ask Isaac and Emily to bring their son, Henry, and they can come up here and join me. We'll scoot things over here. That might mess with our cameraman a little bit, but (laughs) we'll uh, we'll do it anyways. We we always want to shake it up a little. Now, here's the... the, uh, Here's the hard part about this. Um, Isaac has just gotten a job, actually been there for a month, uh, a little bit further south. So they aren't going to be able to be a part of our family here at Mount Moriah other than we love them, they love us, and and we don't lose our kids. (laughs) Um, Emily and I have uh, experienced church together, Camp Carmel together, and we brought Isaac along uh, a few years ago because these two um, love the Lord, and they love each other. Uh, I get to do the wedding ceremony, and now I get to do the baby dedication, and I'm guessing some other pastor somewhere else is probably going to be able to baptize this kid when he comes to know Jesus. But, um, but I'm okay with that, I guess. <laughs> All right, so here's a, here's a little bit of what God has in store for us this morning. You see, in Scripture, God delights in children. He takes great pleasure in them. They are one of the greatest gifts he's given to husbands and wives. In Psalm 127, verse 3, God proclaims that the sons are heritage from the Lord. Children are a reward from him. Because children are a gift from God, it's natural that Christian parents will present and dedicate their child to God. The Gospels we read, the people brought little children and babies to Jesus so that he might place his hands on them and he might pray for them. It even says that parents were bringing their children to be healed by Jesus. And so that's an incredible picture for us to see. 
So what happens is, is in the same way, Isaac and Emily, they are bringing their son, Henry David Carruthers, to present him first themselves and then Henry before the Lord our God so that they might be dedicated to one another and to Christ. Isaac and the family, I call your attention to the commands of God recorded in Holy Scriptures. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7, Jesus and God are telling us that we are to hear and listen. The Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts, and then you are to impress them to your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, and then when you're walking along the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up. There's no higher calling for parents than to teach their children well. Proverbs 10.1 says and reminds us that a wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish son brings grief to his mother. And I'm just going to tell you, as a parent, that works for both ways. The mother and the father are both overjoyed, and then there are times when both the mother and father are a little bit grieved. So that's not specific to to gender. That's just going to be the way it is. But when we think of that, the more you bring him and present him before God and dedicate him to God, the more the chances are or the more likely he is to be a joy and to be a wise son. The very best thing moms and dads can teach their child is to fear the Lord, according to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. It tells us that this is the beginning of all knowledge. In other words, the successful application to all of these scriptures, Henry will learn in life that he can depend on him first learning to fear and follow God. So the church urges you, Isaac and Emily, to love God with every ounce and fiber of your being and to teach Henry to do the same. As you love God, as you love one another, this will be a model before Henry as to how he will live his life, a wonderful life of love for God and love for others. Isaac, Emily, by coming forward today before God and his people, do you hereby desire and wish to show your desire to dedicate yourselves and your son Henry to the Lord? Will you teach him Train him to walk in the ways of the Lord and towards Christ. If so, would you please say, I will. Amen. Awesome. So, having come freely, I ask now that you will enter into the following commitment in the presence of God and his family. So, we're going to have uh, Henry switched back and forth here a little bit. Um, we're, we're working up to where I get him in my hands, and we're going to see how that works because it's, it's been both uh, positive and negative. So, so what's happening here is he's going to walk in an abundant life that Christ has to offer to the point where Isaac and Emily have shown him. It's not necessarily a promise that he will never wander away from the Lord or wander away from the church, as we say, but it's a likelihood that if we bring him up in Christian principles, that he's going to, even though he strays, will return to them. And I think that's important for us to notice. If something, God forbid, would happen that he turns away for a while, we have an assurance that God is not going to abandon or let him go. God will do things continually to draw him back uh, to his presence. So I ask that we would simply pray for Henry, that we would pray for his mom and dad, and that we as Mount Moriah, since they're far away, that we would stay in contact through Facebook, through emails, through phone calls, uh, encourage his grandmother and his grandparents, um, and let them know that we're praying for them and that we're here to help them in any way that we possibly can. I ask that Mount Moriah would make the commitment that as believers in the body of Christ that we have a responsibility to teach the gospel and the story to our younger generation. In fact, the Old Testament prophet Joel commands us to tell of God's works to your children and to let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. So I direct my question now to the congregation. All of those present today... If you would make such a commitment, I ask that you would please stand and that you will help Isaac and Emily be faithful to their commitment. Will you pray for them, encourage them, and help to equip them to be godly parents? Will you help teach and train Henry in the ways of the Lord so that he might one day trust him as Savior and Lord? And if you accept this responsibility, I ask that you would please respond by saying, we will. 
May I have a, let's try this. Hey, Henry. Good morning. It is a good morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for our children. Uh, God, there are so many people in this world that, that need our prayers and that, that need our, our encouragement. But God, these young ones are so special. His heart is innocent, so to speak, right now. Although he has uh, original sin that he will need to someday repent of and, and put his faith and trust in you, God, we pray now that, that that day will come and that it will be encouraged by godly mother, a godly father, and godly people who have invested into this family and loved them as Christ loved them. God, give them joy, give them peace, give them courage, and give them the strength and endurance that they need. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks. That was pretty good. All right. Mount Moriah will, uh, would also like to present you with a certificate of dedication. And uh, you get to take that. And if your parents are as good as mine, you'll have a safe someday. And that will be in there. There you go. And it'll remind you, because you aren't, probably aren't going to remember much, but it'll remind you of what the rest of us got to experience. <laughs> Thank you, guys. God bless you. The world needs more young and godly parents. And that is the truth. So what did we just see here this morning? So what we saw was, again, a dedication of a child. Not a baptism, not a salvation uh, experience, but we get to see the beginning of Henry's life, and hopefully uh, down the years we'll see that life progress uh, and take shape. And, um, and you never know. That kid may someday be a missionary. He may someday be a pastor. He may be someday a businessman who seeks God in everything that he says and does. He might be the smartest kid in the world. He might be the most talented athlete in the world. But we're going to pray that as we encourage them, that he will grow uh, to be like Christ in whatever God places in his life. So I'm not going to lie which is always a good way for a pastor to start a sermon, right? I hear way too often from parents, I or we, depending on the case, need to get my or our kid back in church or in church. Don't get me wrong. I think it is an excellent idea. As a matter of fact, I think it's a great idea. However, they often have waited until the child is older or the child has begun to travel down a wrong path. I mean, that's just simply the way it is. We oftentimes don't try to fix a problem or we don't even recognize a problem until it's too late and we're already in the midst of a trial or a tribulation or a consequence that really we don't even know what to do with at this point. But all of a sudden, somewhere in our mind and in our heart, it clicks. You know what? My parents took me to church. It's not that I turned out a whole lot better. <laughs> It's not that I didn't make any mistakes or, or I didn't experience any of these trials or tribulations, but I remember that there was something about what I learned, something about what I heard that brings comfort, that brings a strength that, that I really can't explain. And we don't necessarily need to bring our kids to church. It's a thought that goes on in my mind that sometimes even comes out of my mouth, not only might it be good for your kid to go to church, but it might be good for you too. Now, some people take that pretty, pretty uh, graciously. Some people not so much. But that's the way it is. We always recognize the things that our kids need, but sometimes it's things that we need in and of ourselves and even in our own lives. Some of the struggles that we've experienced, some of the things that we've, uh, consequences that we've suffered, if we would have just been in a place that encouraged us or, or taught us or raised us up in a way that maybe we would have made a better decision. That's basically what we want for our kids. So let me say this. A Bible-believing, a Bible-teaching church is a really good thing for you and your child. But I'll be honest, it's not the best thing. It's not the best thing. Because the best thing by far 
is for you and your child to be in Jesus. You say, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is a church oftentimes is just simply a place that we go. A church in our own minds is some place that we go, we worship, and we come home, and, and we don't necessarily live there because we have a wrong perception of what church is. The church isn't this building. This church isn't uh, what we do on Facebook or YouTube. The church is what believers do and how believers live their lives in the real world. And so what we really need isn't a lot more of church, although it's helpful, but what we need is a really good, solid foundation in Jesus. Scripture in Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. This is the passage that we'll be jumping from, but honestly, this is a little bit different for me. It's more of a topical study this morning than it is uh, just straight from one Scripture or another. But this is the one that I want us to reflect on, and this is the one I want you to take home and begin to reflect upon and see where you might be in this picture. Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16 says this, And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such things or to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not inherit it. And he took them in his arms, and he blessed them, laying his hands on them. Now, I'm really visual. And when it comes to to stories and and things like this. So the picture I see here is Jesus standing in in a crowd. And all of a sudden, through that crowd, we begin to see parents, maybe grandparents, maybe foster parents, maybe, uh, maybe godparents, maybe a friend, maybe a neighbor bringing kids through the crowd. And as they're coming through the crowd, Jesus is beginning to see kids afar off. And he's thinking to himself, these kids are coming to me. People are bringing these children to me. And then instead of the disciples allowing them to come freely, the disciples start putting up little barriers and roadblocks. So as the people are bringing the kids in, a disciple goes out and says, hey, Jesus doesn't really have time for your child this morning. Could you, could you maybe bring him back when he's a little less busy? Or, or maybe, they, you know, Jesus, he, he doesn't want to be bothered with kids because kids are noisy, kids are, are dirty, kids are, you know, they're, they're, they're sucking on their thumbs. And, and, and nowadays, could you even imagine trying to bring a kid into uh, someone who's super important without a mask and, and rubber gloves and, and a hat and a gown and, and all these things we're, we're, we're doing and putting up every barrier that we possibly can. But Jesus, looking out, says, wait a minute. And it says the word in here, he became indignant. That doesn't mean that he was just like, oh, come on, guys, let him through, let him through. He got angry that people were doing anything, anything at all to keep kids from getting to him. One of the greatest pictures in my life that I remember as a painting, my mom showed it to me, and, and it hasn't been too many years ago, but my mom absolutely loved this painting because instead of the Jesus that's sitting there all reverent and solemn and, and, and people around Jesus, it's got Jesus smiling and not just bringing the kids to him, but he's playing with them. He's got one up on his lap. He's got some of them dancing around, and I can imagine that that's what Jesus looks like around kids. I mean, look at us, how goofy and how silly we'll be for a child. We, we want to be all nice and prim and proper, but you put a kid in front of us, oh, how cute. You, you make those little voices. You, you do all these little things to get them to smile and laugh. You, you do everything you can possibly do to make that child feel comfortable and make that child <laughs> Make that child like you. (laughs) But that wasn't the case with Jesus. There was something about Jesus here that people and kids already wanted to be around. And so as these kids are being brought to Jesus, he wants them there. Do Do we get that picture when we see that? It wasn't that he just allowed them to be there, but he wanted them to be there. It's kind of an amazing picture to me. 
So as I read this scripture, I began to think in the dedication of Henry this morning, I began to think, what is it, what is it that, that we could learn and understand from this passage? And I think there's two things that as parents and my wife, because I don't like preaching to myself a whole lot, so I'll preach more to her this morning. It'll probably soak in and rub in to me. What parents need to hear and to understand. They don't need to hear a motivational speak, a speech from a, from a pastor or, or, or some other speaker. What they need to do is they need to hear Scripture. The two things that I think people need to understand, that parents need to understand especially, is in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 18 through 21. The things that we need to understand. So this is what it says. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Now, there's a lot of things in there, description, traditional, ceremonial, that we don't completely understand. But basically what that passage is saying is everything about my word and everything about me should be constantly on your mind and on your hearts. Wherever you go, whatever you're doing, it should be about God. You should be thinking about what his word says and what his word has instructed. Those are the things that should be constantly in the forefront of our hearts and minds. It says this, then, you shall teach them to your children talking of them when you are sitting in your house and when you are walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. In my house, that pretty much talks about all the time. <laughs> One of those has got me covered. So we go through and it is a little bit further. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them as long as the heavens are above the earth. So what all of those passages are describing, what each of those verses is describing is a responsibility and an opportunity that every parent has a responsibility and an opportunity that every parent has. I don't believe you grow out of it, and I don't believe just because you don't have kids that you're exempt from it. But this is what it teaches. Parents have the responsibility of being spiritual leaders in their child's life. You say, whoa, wait a minute, that was what we brought them to church for. That's why we take them to Sunday school. That's why we take them to Bible school. That's why we enrolled them into a Christian school. We want people to be spiritual leaders in, in my kid's life. They need a spiritual leader. And what this passage is saying, that you are it. You're it. If none of these other things were available, if none of these other things were possible... What the bottom line boils down to is the responsibility of teaching your kids spiritual, godly things is yours. The second thing that it shows is parents can and should be the greatest Christian influence in their child's life. Parents have the greatest opportunity to be a Christian influence in their child's life. You say, well, why is it the parent? Why is that the greatest opportunity? You wake up with your child in the morning. Now, I get this. Today's culture and society, maybe some of us, we, are, we get up before we, our kids do when we go to work. Maybe sometimes we get home late and, and our kids are already in bed. I get it. That, that stuff happens nowadays. But that doesn't make us exempt from being an influence on our children. It, what it means is every opportunity that you have, whether it is at a meal, whether it is at a concert, whether it is at a sporting event, whether it is at church, whether it is at a family reunion, you have an opportunity to show your kids what Jesus looks like. That's the influence you have. That's the influence that your kids, and let me say this clearly, your kids are looking for. How often do we sit there and see teenagers that have gone astray, so to speak, and we sit there and we hear people say, well, you know what? They, they just needed a few boundaries. 
They just needed someone to, to give them a few rules and regulations. And, and psychologists and, and spiritual leaders, they'll all agree across the board that this is ultimately whether kids are not or bucking against it or something that kids are looking for. What it means is, is our kids are looking for direction. And I'm telling you, your kids will find a direction. What determines whether or not it's a good direction or, or a bad direction oftentimes boils down to what the parent's life looks like, what the dad does or says in a given situation, what the mom does or says in a given situation. It's just the way it is. Our kids are looking for influences, and whether you believe it or not, they're looking at you. They're looking at you. So what can we do? Well, let's go back to Scripture. Let's uh, see what this is. And there's a reason why I chose this order, and we'll describe it as we go along. But for you to be the best example and influence in your child's life, you have to be in a right relationship with Jesus yourself. Kids today are way too smart to fall for the idea of do as I say, but not as I do. You want to talk about how smart kids are? Kids can get on the computer, they can do things, and I see heads nodding already. They can do things on the computer that I didn't even know anybody was capable of. I mean, I think sometimes my kid is smarter, my, and I'm talking about the youngest one, is smarter than some of the astrophysicists out there. As they pick up my phone and they do things with my phone that I'm like, oh man, the government's surely going to be at my door knocking eventually, thinking who in the world's calling this guy? Or, uh, and that's with all of the locks and the safeties and everything else on. But your kids are not going to put up with this idea of do as I say. And I can tell you that for a fact. I went through it this morning with Tasso. I can tell him and tell him and tell him and tell him, but if he sees me one time, do it the opposite way, guess which way he's going to do it? He's going to do it the way that he's observed me doing. Not what I've said, but what I have done. So when we get to this idea of what we can do, the first thing that a parent or a grown-up can do in these situations is you need to get your relationship with Jesus on the right track. You need to fix you first. You need to fix you first. Well, my kid needs to be in church. Well, guess what? You needed to be in church first. My kid needs Jesus. Well, guess what? You needed Jesus first because that's where your kid's going to learn. When we look at Peter giving the most, uh, most in-your-face sermon in the world, telling people that they're sinners, telling people that they're doing things wrong, telling people that they'd even killed Jesus, he tells them these things, and when he gets to the end in Acts chapter 2, verses 30 through, 37 through 39, it says, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone from the the Lord our God calls to himself. So when we look at this passage, we see that there are people who don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So they cry out, what do I do? How do I fix my life? How do we take care of this problem of sin that, that I've gone astray or my child has gone astray? And Peter says it's as simple as this. You repent. You turn away from your sins and you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Now, does that solve every problem? No, but it, say, it solves the biggest one. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, what it does is it turns you from a sinner to a saint. It turns you from someone who is headed to hell and destruction to a person who has the eternal hope of Jesus Christ and heaven and eternal life with him. That's what repentance and belief does. So we need that because we need not only to do it for ourselves, but if we're going to teach our kids anything, it says, this promise is for you and it's for your children. So it's a promise that they're meant to hear and they're meant to hear it through you. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, we have been cleansed from all unrighteousness once we put our faith in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. That takes place. But 1 John, John is writing to Christians. You mean Christians still sin? 
Christians still sin. Well, what does that sin do? Is it still going to send us to hell? No, it's not going to send you to hell. But what it does is it separates you and it keeps you from being in a right relationship with God, within fellowship. We're going to have pizza and friends. Basically what it would do is you would be embarrassed if you're sinning. You would be embarrassed to go and be in the presence of God. So God didn't go anywhere, but your sin has kept you from going to him. So how do we fix that relationship? We confess our sins to him and we realize and we come back into this idea of restoring unto me the joy of my salvation. As in David had confessed in the Psalms. So what do we need? Get your relationship with Jesus on the right track. Well, this is simply it. You need repentance, you need faith, and you need continual fellowship through confession with Jesus Christ. Got that? That's what parents need. That's what I need every day when I'm dealing or trying to show my kid Jesus. Why is that important? Well, the next thing is, is we need to get into God's word. And so the reason why we have to have a relationship with Jesus first is because once you know Christ, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to help you understand scripture. We look at scripture when we don't know Christ and we sit there and say, well, I never understand what I read and I never really get anything out of reading the Bible. It's just a bunch of of words and rules and regulations that I don't understand. But once the Holy Spirit enters your being, he begins to interpret these things. He begins to cause you to desire them. He begins to cause you to, to understand them. The Holy Spirit does this. The Holy Spirit's only there once you know Christ. So that's what we need. We need to get into God's Word. People often say that their kids don't come with manuals. Well, maybe this is true in a sense, but this is what happens. If we read God's Word, we see that God's Word gives instructions for every vital part of life, and raising children has not been left out. Raising children's in there. I didn't know that. Maybe you didn't read that. But as a parent... It's hard to ignore once you hear the idea in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 through 17. We're worried about how we raise our children. Well, Timothy says this, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. We want our kids to be good. And it's not about behavioral modification. What it is is about us knowing Christ, knowing what God wants for us as human beings, period, but then understanding that someone's got to teach our kids about this. Who's it going to be? So we need to get into God's Word so that we understand what His good and perfect will is. Thirdly, we need to get on our knees. And parents, we need to get on our knees a lot. If there's one thing I think parents don't do enough for their kids, it's pray for them. One of the most amazing testimonies that I've heard in this church, and I've heard a lot of amazing testimonies. Actually, there were two that that are just absolutely incredible. The one got up here and told us uh, before Thanksgiving how uh, they prayed for their child's salvation from the moment they were born. And they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. And then the day that that person received Christ, what did they pray for next? That they would meet a godly person to be united with. They began praying for their child's spouse to be saved. And then they continue the prayers down and down and down. So when does, a, when does the praying stop as a parent? It never does. And I'm looking out at a few of you saying, yeah, I'm still praying. And keep praying. Because that's what the Bible tells us, folks. That's what the Bible tells us. It's important that we get Scripture before we pray. You know why? Because this is how we know what God's will is. This is how you begin to know more about what to pray for for your children. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says you pray without ceasing. That means you pray everywhere, all the time, anytime, for anything. Your kids should definitely fall in there somewhere. But what should we pray for? Well, it struggled. It was a struggle for me to find exactly what we would pray for our children. 
Uh, I know what I pray for my son, and I know what I've heard other people pray for for their children. But this is the one that I think it boils down to. Paul is praying for the Colossians in chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. And what he prays for the Colossians, I believe we should be praying for our children. We should be praying for ourselves. And it says this, we have not ceased to pray for you. That means we never stop. We just keep on praying. What do we ask for? Asking that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. What do you want to pray for your kids? That's it. That's it. Because if they are walking in this way, if they're paying attention to the spiritual wisdom that comes through his word, if they're walking in a way that is in a manner worthy of the Lord, and they're doing what's fully pleasing to him, they're beginning to bear fruit in every good work, which means they're sharing God's message, they're sharing Christ, and they're increasing in their knowledge and growing closer to him, guess what? You will never go to a pastor again and say, I think my kid needs to get in church. You're going to say, man, I'm going to continue to pray for you, but now I'm going to start praying for your kids. Now I'm going to start praying for my grandkids. Now I'm going to start praying for the next generation. And isn't that what Scripture told us? It's for you. It's for your kids. It's for their kids. And it's for the next generation. That's what getting on your knees does. Then we go to get godly people to help. This is the one where we suffer from, I think. Get godly godly people to help. So this is where grandparents, friends, Christian schools, church, Sunday school, youth group, all of these things are important. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 33, and some of us Christian kids, some of us church kids that have grown up, we've heard this scripture so many times, it makes us sick. But this is what our parents would tell us, right? Bad company ruins good morals. Hang out with the wrong kids, you're guilty by association, but ultimately that's going to be the influence that's going to be in that child's life. Oh, well, you say, well, I I, I do. I'm really careful about who my kids' friends are. Really? Surround your kids with good Christian influences. Every person you allow in your child's life will influence your child, bar none. It's just the way it is. Every person you allow your child to spend time with will influence your child. Say, okay, I still feel pretty good about this. I still feel pretty good about this. It's either a positive manner or not. You mean some of the people that I choose to have my kids around are are bad influences? Maybe. It's their teachers. I understand that. That's why we come to a Christian school. How about it's their coaches? What? What? I mean, athletics matters. The type of person my kid's coach is, that matters. Don't tell my mom. I know this is on Facebook. This has come one of these real moments. You know why I began chewing tobacco when I was a teenager? My coach did it. You know why I had so much trouble with profanity in my life as I grew up into college? My coach, my team, and all of us were influenced by a man who was great in every other aspect of the word. I looked up to this guy. But I realize now some of the struggles that I had, I was actually encouraged to have that behavior. I was influenced by someone who my parents trusted, and I trusted. It happens. It's their friends, and... Parents, this is something that will be eye-opening or maybe not. It's even their friends' parents. You might really like their, their friends, but they go over to spend the night at that person's home. Every habit every that that person's parents has is possibility to influence your child. Are we careful in those situations to make sure that godly people are, are surrounding our kids? We surround our kids with good Christian influence. It's vital. It's important. So then the last is this, get them to Jesus often. Get them to Jesus often. And most importantly, make sure he's the the number one in their lives. 
Here's what I came through a lot of prayer, and this is, this is uh, convicting to, to me as a parent. We encourage them to be straight-A students, don't we? We want the best for them. We encourage them to be graceful dancers. We encourage them to be talented musicians. We encourage them to be all-star athletes. And we spend so much time and devotion in investing into every area of their lives, getting them to those events. I hear parents say all the time, I don't know how we're going to get Timmy to baseball while we get Lexi to dancing, and then I have a meeting at this time, but we have to get him from, dan- uh, yeah, him from dancing, him from baseball over to fall league basketball, and, and we do all of these different things, and I'm not being critical. I'm just telling you how it is and how it is in my life, and how it begins to get. And I I know some of your parents are sitting there going, I understand, and some of your parents are saying, I can't believe he's preaching at me. It comes here first. Well, my wife first, then it comes here. But this is convicting, folks. We do all of these things, and I'm not saying that these things aren't important because they absolutely are. What I'm saying is that these things... These things aren't the most important thing in your child's life. I wouldn't even say they're second. Maybe not even third, but they're they're important, but they're not the most important. But sadly, we don't see and we don't invest in their relationship with Jesus like we do every other thing that we encourage them to do. Either we don't see the value in it, or we think they can do it later on life, or, or, or what it is, but we just... We just don't see the value to invest our kids into Jesus. And then sadly, most of us wonder later on, why is my child the way he is? Why is my child the way she is? Mark chapter 10, 13 through 16. This takes out a bunch of the other stuff, but it just simply says, states how it is. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. Jesus saw it, and he said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And he took them in his arms, and he blessed them, laying his hands on them. Okay, can you see your kids? Can you see your kids? In Jesus' arms, right now. You see it? It's visual. You see it? He blessed them, and he laid his hands on them. Maybe he's healed them, and the ultimate healing your child can receive is the forgiveness of sins. He's healed them. What's the the consequence if we don't take this seriously? Parents, this is for me, but maybe God wants you to listen in. Jesus revealed this scripture to me. Matthew chapter 18, verses 5 through 6. It's not too late. Let me say that up front. It's not too late. Jesus can still do what Jesus does. But in Matthew 18, 5 through 6, he says, Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf behalf, is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. That's extreme, Pastor Darrell. That's just not even fair. That's extreme. That's God's word, folks. I don't want... I don't necessarily like that passage... I don't necessarily want that passage to pertain to me. But the only way that it won't is if I'm intentional in doing what God wants me to do and being who God wants me to be in my child's life. What does God want for us as parents? What does he expect for us as parents? He expects us to take the responsibility of being spiritual leaders in our child's life. He expects us to take that seriously and into prayerful consideration. What does God want for me 
as a Christian parent. He wants me to be the greatest Christian influence in my child's life. I can bring my kids to church. I can bring my kids to Sunday school. I can enroll them in Mount Moriah Christian School. I can take them to vacation Bible school. I can send my kid to Camp Carmel every Sunday. But there is nothing that is going to replace God's word lived out through godly parents. We dedicated Emily and Isaac, and they had no idea they were going to be that big of an illustration for us this morning. But I don't want them to just be an illustration. I want godly parents to be what we aspire to. Paul said, not that I've achieved all these things. I am not the perfect parent. (laughs) Duh. (laughs) Ask my kids, ask my wife, ask my mother-in-law. I'm not the perfect parent. But God has chosen to use me and my kids' lives so that they might see Jesus. That's my responsibility. And I have to rededicate myself to that moment by moment by moment. The altar is open this morning. We're not going to have a bunch of people piled on top of each other, but if you want to come and pray, confess your sins and repent and get your life back on track with Jesus so that you can be a better example for your grandkids, for your kids, then you come up, you find a little space, and you pray. If you want to dedicate yourself to Christ again here this morning, this is your opportunity. If you want to come up and pray for your kids, this is your opportunity. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you and we praise you. Um, You are our Father. You are our example. And as an example, God, you did absolutely everything you could to make sure that your kids were taken care of. You made sure that Jesus was available to each and every one of us as an opportunity not only for salvation but as an opportunity for us to live our lives in a way that is worthy in a manner that is worthy of of what you've done for us so God not only help us to to teach our kids but help us to live and walk in a way that is spirit led in our own lives and then God not that we have to be uh, dictators or or we have to be mean and and, and, and Uh, terrible spirits in raising our kids but God help us to love them in the way that you loved us demonstrating to them that that even when we did bad things you loved us and you wanted to bring us back to them help us to discipline them in a way that is gentle in a way that is kind but God ultimately points people to Jesus points our kids to Jesus it's not that they won't struggle because we struggled but it's that they'll have Jesus to walk through those storms of life with them God, aren't we thankful for the times that you walked with us? God, we pray these things in Jesus' name this morning. Amen.